So I'm going to read it um, first from Frail Craft. It was published a year ago, but the poems are older, of course. It takes time for things to come out. And um, so most of what I'll read today is from a new manuscript called Take to Hand, um, mostly because it's what I'm thinking about now. Both books are very much influenced by my studies in literature, art history, and semiotic theory, that is, influenced by UC Berkeley and, and the amazing teachers I've had here. Um, and they're both in inspired by visual works that teach one to see oneself see. The title, Frail Craft, while purposely abstract, wants above all to conjure a perceptual space marked by transience, by an attention which moves, as the book's final poem ex explains, from plain to peak to fog toward the idea of ocean, which is to say, from the world we know like the backs of our hands to the intangible and wildly expansive spaces of the imagination. Frailcraft opens with the poem Journey, which suggests, as does the Chaucerian dream vision, that the roles of writer, dreamer, and reader are fundamentally the same. Each follows, as another of my poems puts it, the lead that led astray. Journey. Because the valley spreads wide, ridged with the signs we read, or because what we needed was always at hand, reach down and there was a book, there a slipper, there a glass of ice cold water. Hopefully we walked the paths before us, there was a burr bush, there a blue jay, quail and other creatures, too many to follow. Where did we go once we lost their lead? Which is to say, where did we not go? Quick, quick, they called to us. But we heard only the sound of our boots on dried leaves and were mesmerized. We spoke to one another of things in the path. We chucked to our horses when we had them. And when we had hats, we took them in our hands and hallooed to the passers-by, Brahma bull, bright green bird, though we were not yet out of the wood. Instead, it closed in around us. Deep were its streams and the trees thick around and thick together. And we were lost and called out to our horses, I'm sorry, and called out for a guide until our voices grew rough and we be decided we'd better save them. We tried to climb to a loft in the branches, being wary of night's prowlers, but the trunk tore our hands and we bedded down in a hollow, the horse's quiet whinny, our lullaby. And what do you think we dreamt there in the forest with no voice left to call with? We dreamt of the spread palm of the valley, of the path that led from ridge to ridge, past elation, and then into the forest. <coughs> I used to know that by heart, and I guess I don't, I don't anymore. <laughs> Sad, the attrition of knowledge. In much the same way that Journey describes movement without destination, many of the poems in Frail Craft investigate the way that perception leads us out of ourselves and into a phenomenological relation with the world. And yet the eye, which operates in the realm of image, can only carry us so far toward the material world and it is for this reason that sight is such a strong metaphor for desire, which the next poem explores. It's called Canal. Canal. Because despite the eye's illusion, parallel lines do not converge. So it was that we walked the canal in tandem, you on the north side, I on the south, I watched you stoop to fix your shoe as you took off your jacket and then put it back on again. I knew you were cold, too, when the wind came and the rains and then snow, sleet, hail. Such offense taken, though there never was a crime, never the imagined tryst in the summer canal, our bodies pale against the night black reeds. But if the eye can love, and it can, it does, then I held you and was held. 
So much of this book um, is interested in thinking about dream. Um, for me, dream has uh, been instructive not only in my uh, literary work, but also in my criticism. Um, it, but it's taught me more than anything else. Studying dream has taught me more than anything else about, um, about how associative and symbolic logic actually works. Um, and many of the poems in this first book recount actual dreams. This is one of those, and um, it's for my husband, um, Dan. Love letter. We were gardening, then you were gone, though the seedlings still had to be planted, and I figured you had gone to make us tea. You took a long time, though, and I thought, who does he think he is, leaving it all to me? I went in. I wasn't allowed to see you, though I knew you'd still be in your triple-stitched car hearts with dirt perennially in the half-dozen pockets. And yet it was I who had seen first where we were headed, in the valley, a long way down. I knew we would reach it on foot, though we might as well take the train, because of the cold and the distance and the late hour of the day. All that and the visions you brought me, gone. I wished for it back then, even if only our fights in the basement. And the final poem that I'll read um, from Frailcraft is um, a poem that doesn't need much preface. Uh, it has one line in French, qui donne du plaisir en a, which translates um, roughly, he or she who gives pleasure has it. And it's called the right, right to pleasure, which I wish for all of you. You would think that I go mad with grief when the white sails fill and the keel cuts the waters like a knife honed on whetstone. That's the way you're taught to interpret these signs. Matted hair, the salt dirt lines where sweat has run, hands that feed the mouth but will not wipe it. But when my love decides to go and then is gone, I can still taste him bitter in the throat I still feel the weight of his body as he fights sleep. I do not fight it. On the contrary, I live there. And what you see in me that you think grief is the refusal to wake, that is to say, is pleasure. Qui donne du plaisir en a. And so if, when he couldn't sleep in that long, still night, you sensed it and woke to show him how to unfasten each, and every button, then it is promised you, even when he goes. So while Frailcraft explores the necessary distance between subject and object imposed by sight, my current collection, Take to Hand, instead engages the theme of embodiment. The book's overarching question is how to locate the lyric within a time of war. Here, lyric perception becomes a form of vigilance that distinguishes itself or tries to from a vigilante American foreign policy. This vigilance also finds expression in the private domain. Among other things, the book addresses such extreme states as pregnancy and fever in which the distinctions between subject and object blur um, and radical embodiment becomes paradoxically a mode of disembodiment. The first poem that I'll read, as, as many of the ones that follow, um, operates more or less as a metonymic chain. Let's see, where is it? Hurt. Things that can't be held, can't be helped in the mind. The latest horror of the latest war, never on these shores. Like the book of bodies you opened in a shop and then closed, choosing not to carry such a thing home. But I am guilty of false logic. Upon waking, for example, the child cries with the sound that means hurt. Dream has hurt her, I conclude, though I don't remember if there's a chapter on the infant. The dream life of angels is said to be made of ice and snow, white on white, as if an understudy. 
that blankness becomes a wall of light, a screen, or the partition your fingertips trace passing by. Touch is a kind of love, but there is something unseen on the opposite side. Sound passes through the blockade. What to make of what you hear? Sounds like a strategy in the game of charades indicated by a hand cupping an ear. The words remain unsaid. Talk is in the head when shushing a child, when washing whites as the child sleeps, or whitewashing the walls. This is what is meant by to draw a blank. She is practicing erasure. She has practiced at it. Turn the dial, they are turning to the war, stitched like a slip on a bias. It gives a sense of the body underneath. More than one can play the part, the role remains the same, even as the actors change in the wings. The understudy missed her cue, daydreaming, or else the wings of her dress got caught up in the curtains, and so it was that the final phrase was danced behind the onlooker's astonished eyes. That is also a stage, or a stage in thought, which begins the moment the dancer falls. She fell, they remarked, with a grace like dancing, and from the ashes, the papers later read, emerged the phoenix with its glittering wings this being the argument for transformation, which leads to destruction being framed as a gift. I experienced the compulsion to write as the desire to follow language and thought from one thing to the next, and my interest in metonymy and in etymology, which this next poem addresses, are the result of this compulsion. It's called Derive, um, and it's indebted not only to the Oxford English Dictionary, which um, gives a timeline, among other things, for each word, which was important to the composition of this poem, but also to this um, beautiful poem by William Carlos Williams called Queen Anne's Lace. Um, those of you who know it will hear it echoed in the poem's final line. Derive. Canker in the mouth, on the rose, in the bowl of the tree. The skin of the roof of the mouth peeling away. Vulnerable to damage, as when the name of a color and the name of a thing are the same. Bowl for bowl, for example. This is the color children choose for trees. Named for the thing or the thing for the color, only most are a lighter brown. Or bowl a clod. Therefore, its color, fallow, the color of fallow fields. Whose sheaf of wheat, whose heavy millstone sunken, who pricketh his blind horse over the fallows? Early words harrowed by the plow, and harrow for the soldier's formation, the bird's migration, the name of their kind derived from the Greek for wine blossom because they land there when the grapes flower and also for the fallows they fly from as in fallow chat, finch, smitch, smiter. Names for a bird named for an ear of wheat or wheat ear for white arse like driving the wrong way down the narrow highway. We saw the red car headed into trouble, the snowy mountain that rose from the desert. Danger was part of its beauty, the thin throat of the pale girl, the pale throat of the thin one, a causeway of veins running blue under her skin. The five points of the star pendant were razor sharp, one pricked the hollow and blood made a jewel there. As when the lace maker pricks her finger, a drop of red in the field of white, a flower named for that, at its center the blood mark, where desire mars the beloved, not so white as, but white as can be. Um, this next poem is hot off the press, and I'm not really sure how to 
preface it. Um, it's uh, like like other poems of mine. It troubles the the distinction between poetry and prose. Um, it's it's long and narrative and in prose blocks, um, and it's called Parable. From the highway, we saw the mountains. We didn't need a map to tell us what they were called. Between incisors was a castle just perched there. The vote had been to pull off. We passed through a few towns before the road came to an end. We parked by a high wall cloaked in passion flower vines and hungry stole some of its fruit. You said, come along, my princess, and tucked a blossom behind my ear. The wall, we had thought, would hide our theft, but a man was just opening the gate. Come inside, he said. They are better with wine. We followed him into the kitchen where there was a table already set with glasses. A small, sharp knife with the imprint of the abbe lay on its side. He pried my hand open and took from it the damaged fruit, from my hair the flower. Read it, he said, so that I may read you. It was, I knew, a story of the passion, though I did not remember who played all the parts in that gruesome tale. My tongue lay still in my mouth, though the knife made quick work of dissecting the fruit, which in the end was filled with the larva of bees. What have you suffered, he asked, and I saw that a fork propped open my book. Why then should he want to read my palm as well? I did not want him to hold my hand open to bring the light closer any more than I wanted to find myself in the scene I once saw. In a rough-hewn farmhouse kitchen, a knife like his slipped while cutting a girl's hair and, slitting her brow, freed the spiders nesting there. She was a reader by trade and knew what they spelled, their black bodies arranged like type on the white of a page. Some things only the body can tell. I have lived in this house when the water ran and when it ran dry, he said, by which he meant that someday soon someone would find him. Neighbors in the valley brought by what they grew. There would be a basket of produce carried away, a bottle saved for the wake. We do know, after all, what the future holds. But you are also a host, a runaway bird, he said, pouring the wine. We drank in silence, too startled to answer, and followed again as he stood from the table, took our hands in his hands, and led us out into sunlight. This is day, he assured us, bright and unshadowed. You're already well on your way. We weren't sure what he meant, but thanked him and turned, glad to be out of the, that strangest of houses. I wanted to shout, but knew he was watching, had seen me already a long time ago. So I just took your hand, seemingly casual, and walked on past where the road met its end. Finally, the castle rose from the outcropping. In parts now broken, still it stood against the sky, its little windows cut out as with scissors. The doors were blocked, so you hoisted me up to the lowest window, then found a foothold and followed me through it. The castle, it seemed, was well discovered. On makeshift tables, we found thousands of boxes, each marked on its side with the name of the thing that had been pulled out of the rubble. Coins of gold, silver chain, bits of iron, leaden bullets. One table for metal, one for bone of ox and fowl, and digits arranged in a box by finger, and bits of skull with their dentilated edges. Human, mind you. Someone lived inside this room, you say, peering through the eye sockets. This next piece is called Bildungsroman. It's in four sections, um, but there are no numbers between sections, so I'll just sort of make a long pause. And I think the only thing that you really need to know to follow it um, 
is that in the Renaissance, one of the many names um, given to this bird, the kestrel, a falcon, um, uh, that inspired the Hopkins great sonnet, um, one of the many names given to that bird over time has been Windpucker. Bildungsroman. Have you watched the bird, the Renaissance, called Windfucker, beating its wings to keep still? That's what it was like. I looked down from above at the landmarked earth as the bird flies, a way of saying it's harder by foot. But the sky is also a medium, though not like the page, dimensional, deep, a different kind of sea. Body says, open, open. We could go down here or here, follow the lead of the unafraid eye. My mind protected me from the flip side of joy. It was a sort of a glass I stayed warm inside. A nondescript place, blank as a safe house. I took down a book to pass by the time. The book is a kind of a body. Turns out that is so. Book cracked open the sensual world in code. It was bedtime or nap time when mind took off in me as proof of thought was a little engine whirring. I had to think hard to keep out of harm the trees and power lines, a net of obstruction The way forward like following a chalk line in the snow field, day measured by the progress of the shadow on the wall. I should say of the sick room, but I was in body whole, a meeting house, whiteness, but how to know if spirit moved. The frozen stream, another surface for snow's accumulation. The mind like that also, slowly moving underneath. I'm going to close today with a poem called Vigil. Um, its second section refers to Rembrandt's famous 1642 painting called The Night Watch, which portrays an armed militia. If you've been to the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam, you've seen it there. Um, the building was pretty much designed around that painting. In writing this poem, I was moved to reclaim vigilance as an ethical action and as a necessary mode of attention in this dark historical time. This vigilance is not merely a poetic act. It also encompasses the candlelight vigils that form a hallmark of passive resistance, as well as the sort of watching that I did as a peace observer in Chiapas when I was just out of college 10 years ago now. Things that can't be held can't be helped in the mind. That is the fundamental moral problem with which Take to Hand opens. Vigil attempts to answer that, um, I'm sorry, Vigil answers that pro problem by attempting to hold the intangible in the mind. Um, yeah. And it's a, and it's a form of, um, a form of attention that I found very much part of, part of mothering many of the poems um, in the book, which which I've read other times in Berkeley, so I'm not reading again today, have, have more to do with that experience. Um, so, Vigil. Again the stag walks by with the thrust, thrust, looks back, two-pointer. That's one way to mark time. Was a male word once, Vigil of Vigilante, the night watch, or posted at the barricades. Nine birds on the bush, who knows how many in it. Across the estuary, a town with a few lights on, the egret in the fields between, also a kind of light, takes flight over them alights further on. 
The child, napping late, fights for the title, wraps her hand through the bra strap. What can no longer be seen still is sometimes. Either way, it crosses into memory, as if the darkness, which is almost here, disassembled the world. Stillness of the black screen of night lit here and here like gunfire, a word chosen to say that we live even here in a time of war, which is unrevoked, a red-lined word. World we live in, we don't know what it means. We watch over it, can't see much now. Water in the narrow canal catches whatever light is left, is a silver shadow, a sliver through dark fields. It points to the lights, a car if moving. If not, someone lives there, is there now, or leaves the light on to keep watch. Thank you very much.